Good afternoon, all. Um, this is David Gator continuing on with our spinal cord injury lecture series. We're going to be talking about aging uh, with a spinal cord injury today, and I will uh, pass on what I know um, about the uh, latest recommendations for health maintenance. Um, as we go through this, I'll talk through the pathophysiology of the natural aging process, that is for those without a spinal cord injury, and then talk through the influences of the spinal cord injury on the aging process and why we feel like it's accelerated. Um, we'll talk about the influence of spinal cord injury on each organ system and um, talk about uh, potentially some things that we can do to uh, reduce or to slow the aging process uh, for those with spinal cord injury. So I'd like to think that uh, as we age, we gain more wisdom. Um, and sometimes that's the case, but not always. Um, as we continue to work with our folks with spinal cord injury and see that uh, they seem to be uh, aging at an accelerated rate, I wonder sometimes if we uh, need to intervene to a greater extent than we have to this point. So what is it that causes us to age? All of us will have uh, the formation of free radicals, um, results of just more exposure to time here on earth and, and to the sun, natural radiation and those types of things. There's also an inflammatory response that goes along with uh, certain tissues as we age, particularly uh, adipose tissue. And we'll talk through that a little bit more. And then uh, because of hypoxic conditions. So the less, um, oxygen that we have available to our uh, tissues and organs, uh, the more likely they are to uh, accelerate uh, into an aging process. As we look at uh, mitochondria, we know that um, as mitochondria age and mitochondria are, are present throughout uh, cells of our entire body, um, they have less of an ability to survive a hypoxic insult. Um, they have fewer um, machinery, uh, I guess I could say, uh, to allow for oxidative phosphorylation. And so we see a progressive decline that occurs with aging. Um, there are structural and enzymatic protein deficiencies uh, such that it becomes more and more difficult to uh, provide DNA and RNA synthesis uh, to replenish uh, tissues and organs. Um, and then generally speaking, as cells age, they have less capacity to take up nutrients um, and more likelihood of chromosomal damage with less ability to repair that. So generally speaking, as we look at older cells, uh, we note uh, some very uh, specific morphological features, uh, particularly to the mitochondria. And we see individuals who age um, and over a similar uh, span of years, you can see how Christopher Reeve, for example, had aged from 1978 to 1996, just after his spinal cord injury. And then in just a, a few years after that, um, his aging process appeared to be accelerated much beyond what would have been expected. So, so what contributes to that? Um, our, uh, a spinal cord is part of our central nervous system. We know that within the central nervous system uh, and particularly the cord, we have uh, the somatic nervous system, which uh, has to do with the uh, sensory uh, dermatomes and motor myotomes at each level of the cord at about one centimeter intervals. We also know that we have the autonomic nervous system uh, as, uh, as it integrates with the central nervous system, the uh, parasympathetic fibers coming from the cranial nerves and the, and the sacral nerves, uh, whereas the sympathetic nervous system arises from the thoracolumbar regions of the cord. And so as we look at how those play on each other, we recognize that disruption of the autonomic nervous system could result in significant uh, organ dysfunction um, and we're going to be spending a fair amount of time talking about that today. So again, the sympathetic nervous system arises from the thoracolumbar regions of the cord. Sympathetic nervous system conveys fight or flight responses. Uh, that is mobilizing substrates, mobilizing resources in a crisis uh, situation. Um, parasympathetic nervous system is... Uh, 
is is always on. It's never off, as uh, as is the case with the sympathetic nervous system. They are always on to some extent, but uh, generally speaking, under those crisis situations, the parasympathetic nervous system withdraws, um, and then uh, following the crisis, the parasympathetic nervous system is especially important uh, to convey energy conservation. That is restoring all of the substrates and resources that were utilized during the crisis situation. So the two, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are in a constant state of tug of war. Usually one um, is uh, dominant over the other. Um, after a spinal cord injury, we recognize that there are uh, significant influences on the autonomic nervous system as well as the somatic nervous system contributing to a number of comorbidities that we're gonna talk through, um, particularly as they relate to the aging process. We know that uh, with, uh, with all of us, but especially with spinal cord injury, we see physiological, functional, socioeconomic, psychological, and then individual factors contributing to the aging process. All of us um, have a certain uh, genetic makeup that um, uh, allows us uh, to uh, age at a faster or slower rate, uh, depending, but that can be influenced significantly by a spinal cord injury. So um, as we look through the organ systems, I will spend a little bit of time going through the special senses, uh, but then I'm going to spend most of our time talking through these different uh, organ systems and how they are in, impacted by spinal cord injury. Vision, um, as we all know, uh, as we age, the uh, the optic lens becomes less flexible and we develop presbyopia, uh, meaning that um, we need reading glasses uh, basically in order to compensate uh, for the less flexible lens. Uh, there's a thinning of rods and cones. And so our night vision often is influenced. Um, and we start to lose some of the uh, the ability to distinguish colors um, and whatnot. So many people, as they get older, uh, choose brighter and brighter clothing uh, because they enjoy uh, at least the, the memory of uh, being able to have that full spectrum of vision. Um, after spinal cord injury, we recognize that there are some neck range of motion limitations, particularly those with um, uh, fused uh, cervical spines and potentially hypotension that contributes further to the um, aging process of our vision. Um, we know that uh, all of us will experience some sensory neural hearing loss. Um, generally speaking, as we get older and older, we lose the ability to distinguish high-pitched sounds. Um, and uh, there is some noise-induced hearing loss that comes just because of the total volume, so to speak, of uh, auditory influences over a lifetime. Um, there may be some bone conduction hearing loss as well. Um, these things are further compromised in spinal cord injury, particularly for those with higher levels of injury because of, again, limited range of motion and positioning, and then ventilator noise interference for those folks who are using ventilators. Taste uh, for all of us. Um, gets a little bit less as we uh, age. Um, our ability to distinguish sweet, sour, salty, and bitter uh, is uh, dampened, uh, so to speak, um, as we get older. Um, that would be further compromised by persons with spinal cord injury who uh, have a tracheostomy or on a ventilator um, who are using mouth stick implements or oral appliances to assist with their um, environmental uh, devices to allow them to be more independent. So again, um, potential uh, increased loss of taste because of spinal cord injury. And then similarly, the sense of smell. Um, all of us, as we get older, our sense of smell diminishes, um, but those who uh, have a spinal cord injury, particularly those uh, with a trach on a ventilator, mouth stick implements um, and oral appliances are gonna be more likely to lose their sense of smell as they age. So let's talk through some of the or other organ systems, the cardiovascular aging process for all of us. Um, generally speaking, our cardiac output decreases as we age. 
Um, so our uh, resting stroke volume and heart rate generally are going to change our, our maximal heart rate, I'll put it that way. Um, our afterload, uh, we have a uh, reduction in elasticity of the arterioles in particular, and so are more likely to develop hypertension, high blood pressure. And our preload tip, typically is diminished um, as we age because of a reduced uh, overall plasma volume. So this is just what all of us are going to encounter as we age. Um, for persons with spinal cord injury, because of the uh, autonomic influences in particular, um, we see a hypotension associated with reduced vasoconstriction and uh, reduced venoconstriction, including the inferior vena cava um, and an inferior impaired uh, venous pump uh, because our uh, lower extremity muscles um, are not voluntarily active. Um, so this means that we're gonna have a reduced preload. Uh, so the, the preload, remember, is the left ventricular end diastolic volume uh, that is the result of blood returning to the heart. Um, and um, except for when a person is lying down, this is gonna be significantly impaired for persons with spinal cord injury. Part of that is because of a reduced stroke volume. Um, associated with an adaptive myocardial atrophy. Remember that the heart is pushing against a lower afterload, generally speaking, uh, because of the spinal cord injury and it has a reduced preload. And so both of those are gonna to contribute to a smaller stroke volume. Uh, that is the ejection fraction is gonna be diminished. As well, because of the blunted sympathetic nervous system associated with higher levels of injury, uh, folks are going to um, have a limited ability to increase their heart rate. Um, and that's because of, again, a parasympathetic dominance. So it's very rare, even under maximal exercise conditions that we would see uh, a heart rate over 120 beats per minute for persons with spinal cord injury, T3 and above. We will manage the neurogenic hypotension initially. Uh, just trying to uh, get them used to a lower blood pressure. Uh, so using recline wheelchairs and tilt tables just to get them to be able to sit or stand uh, upright. We can provide mechanical support, including abdominal binders um, and compression garments, make sure that they're adequately hydrated and um, that they have sufficient uh, sodium uh, to hold on to some uh, additional fluid at the kidneys. Um, oftentimes in the early stages of spinal cord injury, we'll have to use Florinef or Midodrine uh, to help uh, maintain their blood pressures. Generally speaking, however, as our uh, population continues to age, uh, they will accumulate more fat. We'll talk about this later. Um, that oftentimes will completely offset the neurogenic hypotension associated with the sympathetic blunting. Um, our, our folks with spinal cord injury, especially initially, are gonna be at high risk for uh, venothromboembolus. Um, the newest guidelines uh, from the Paralyzed Veterans of, Amor uh, of America, the consortium guidelines, um, talk about the use of mechanical prophylaxis as well as uh, anticoagulant or chemical uh, prophylaxis prophylaxis um, during the acute phase of spinal cord injury. And the bottom line is that they're recommending prophylaxis um, for uncomplicated spinal cord injury at least eight weeks, for complicated uh, at least 12 weeks. And that can include a combination of um, pneumatic compression devices and uh, typically low molecular weight heparin. Um, Autonomic dysreflexia is something that is uh, unique to spinal cord injury, and it occurs because of a noxious stimuli below the level of their injury for persons who have injury T6 and above that causes a, a concomitant sympathetic reflex outflow and uh, a hypertensive crisis. Um, so as you recall, any noxious stimuli, often this is associated with a distended bladder, but it could be distended bowel, it could be um, a, a fracture or a sprain, an ankle sprain, for example, it could be an ingrown toenail. Any noxious stimuli that you or I would perceive as painful um, 
a person with spinal cord injury wouldn't necessarily sense the pain, uh, but that information ascends the cord is blocked at the level of the spinal cord injury and you get this reflex sympathetic outflow causing splanchnic vasoconstriction and hypertension. Increased pressure is sensed by baroreceptors that send information to the medulla, which sends information back to the heart to slow it down. Um, but below the level of the injury, the person remains vasoconstricted. Above the level of the injury, you'll see flushing, sweating, they will get a pounding headache that we call autonomic dysreflexia. Um, and so uh, all of our folks who are at risk, we teach them about managing acute autonomic dysreflexia, elevating the head first to try to get the blood pressure down, loosen tight clothing, leg bags, et cetera, and then check first uh, the bladder, then the bowel, and then look for other potential sources if necessary, using pharmacological intervention to control the blood pressure. Typically, we're gonna use nitropaste uh, until we're able to find a source. Uh, one of the nice things about nitropaste is you can wipe it off as opposed to these other uh, medications. Uh, once ingested, um, it's hard to um, uh, turn around uh, the influences that they're gonna have on the body. Um, for those who have a, uh, say, a chronic wound or a fracture or something like that, that we're not going to be able to treat immediately, there's going to be some long-term uh, consequences of this, we can put them on dibenzaline um, and or use uh, prazosin or terazosin uh, to help keep their blood pressure in check so that it doesn't go way out of control until such time as the, that noxious stimuli has healed. So heart disease in persons with spinal cord injury is um, higher than would be expected if a person didn't have spinal cord injury, primarily because of these three things, obesity, uh, insulin resistance, and dyslipidemia. Um, we know that as people age, uh, their percent body fat uh, increases, um, much more so for persons with spinal cord injury who have a very low resting metabolic rate and have a hard time uh, modifying their dietary intake to accommodate that. So um, we also know that BMI is not a good indicator. Uh, a BMI of 25 for a person with spinal cord injury is reflective of about 35% body fat uh, for somebody with spinal cord injury. And so these folks are going to be at high risk for metabolic uh, syndrome because of a central obesity um, and insulin resistance, hypertension, and dyslipidemia associated with adipose tissue. So adipocytes impair fibrinolysis. What does that mean? Um, well, fibrinolysis means the ability to break down blood clots uh, and therefore it prevents thrombus formation. Adipocytes secrete two substances that we know of, taffy and pi, thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor, taffy, and plasminogen activator inhibitor. Both of these um, cause stickiness of the blood, uh, particularly uh, through their influence on uh, <clears throat> fibrin and on the platelets. Um, and so uh, this is one uh, reason why a person who has more adipose tissue is more likely to develop coronary artery disease. Um, adipocytes are also pro-inflammatory. We know they release a number of uh, inflammatory cytokines and those cytokines are significantly higher in persons with spinal cord injury than we see in the able-bodied population. Um, we know that under normal circumstances, uh, we don't see a lot of these pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines that we see associated with obesity. Um, <clears throat> and I've talked about these uh, in a number of my lectures as we talk about adipose tissue, cardiometabolic syndrome, and um, management of that. Uh, again, these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines are released from uh, adipocytes and or their stromal macrophages. So we see an increase in tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, interleukin 1b, interleukin 6, uh, monocyte chemoattracted protein and nuclear factor kappa b, um, all of which will contribute further to um, the things that we're going to talk about next. So adipose tissue mediated hypertension. As uh, we develop 
um, and hold on to more adipose tissue, uh, we see a number of things contributing to high blood pressure. Leptin resistance, uh, activation of sympathetic nervous system, uh, both muscular uh, sympathetic nervous system activity as well as renal uh, sympathetic nervous system activity. There is a change in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system so that we see an increase in uh, angiotensinogen, angiotensin. We see a reduction in nitric oxide uh, because of a, a impaired insulin signaling. And we also see that um, adipose tissue secretes substances that uh, increase sodium and fluid retention. As well, um, there is involvement with adipose tissue on the uh, nature uritic peptide catabolism so that we see um, more and more problems uh, with this. We see a, a, a mechanical renal compression of the kidneys, ureters, renal veins, and parenchyma because of adipose tissue um, on those uh, particular structures. And then overall, we know that as, uh, as the uh, arterial sclerosis increases, our vessels, particularly arterial vessels, will increase in uh, their stiffness, that is reduced elasticity, and further contribute to hypertension. And there's been uh, a number of studies that have demonstrated this. Surprisingly, we um, reported out on about 8,000 veterans in 2007. We're surprised to see that despite the sympathetic blunting that would an anticipate um, a neurogenic hypotension, um, at least a quarter of our folks had uh, what was felt to be hypertension, um, those with spinal cord injury. Uh, and um, we, were, we were a bit surprised at that at the time. Since that time, we have uh, collected more and more information. Barry reported out in 2013 that more than 50% of veterans with traumatic spinal cord injury had hypertension. Um, and uh, com compared to, uh, as, as you looked at those non-matched controls, um, while we didn't see as many folks uh, with spinal cord injury having hypertension, we were very surprised still to see that there was uh, much more than neurogenic hypotension, which was expected. We reported out 55% of almost 500 veterans uh, uh, taken at random had uh, true hypertension. Um, and about 50% of that population uh, actually had tetraplegia. Um, and then more recently, we had demonstrated that in 72 individuals, and I'll share more of this data in a little bit, 43% uh, of these uh, folks had hypertension. Um, now, in this population, there was only about 28% of those with tetraplegia. Um, <clears throat> we also know that vis visceral fat causes dyslipidemia, and that was partly because of an increase in non-esterified fatty acids presented to the portal circulation uh, of the liver, in which case, remember the bad cholesterol, which is spewing <coughs> triglycerides and fatty acids out into the vascular tree um, comes from the liver, as does HDL cholesterol, the high density lipoprotein, which cleans up the mass in the arterial tree. But um, as you increase these non-esterified non fatty acids, you actually overwhelm the portal circulation of the liver, and we see an increase in LDL and a reduction in HDL. And so that's been demonstrated in a number of different populations um, over the years. Um, again, somewhere above 70% uh, of folks who have a spinal cord injury more than a year out will develop low um, levels of high density lipoprotein. Uh, so the HDL cholesterol decreases, putting them at significant risk for developing arterial sclerosis. We know that adipocytes also cause insulin resistance through a number of different mechanisms. Um, and over the years, um, let me just remind you that uh, this is a cell, and typically we think of a muscle or a liver, liver cell um, that has an insulin receptor and glucose transporters within the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, these glucose transporters um, need to be activated uh, in order to migrate to the cell membrane and allow passage of glucose into the cell. 
So um, typically what we see, and these are glucose molecules supposedly, um, as we increase the glucose uh, in the plasma, it stimulates the release of insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas, and that activates the PI3 kinase cascade that is necessary to activate these GLUT4 receptors, allowing their migration and subsequent transport of uh, glucose into the cell. So there are a number of factors by which uh, adipose tissue impairs the insulin uh, signaling cascade. Um, and without going through these in details, just recognize that there are at least eight different mechanisms um, by which adipose tissue will block uh, the insulin signaling cascade. And so um, as you would expect, there is an increase in diabetes in our population with spinal cord injury, much above that would be expected uh, just from their uh, genetic makeup. So what is metabolic syndromes defined a couple of different ways by different groups. Uh, the adult treatment panel three of the National Cholesterol Education Project um, has listed primarily uh, ad uh, abdominal obesity as being the primary culprit associated with uh, changes in lipids, blood pressure, and fasting glucose, whereas the World Health Organization felt that the insulin resistance plays a larger role. Um, and then if it's tied together with um, uh, impaired uh, fasting glucose um, or uh, hypertension, um, dyslipidemia, then that could be it. The um, International Diabetes Federation uh, updated their uh, definition in 2005 and have stuck to it uh, pretty readily. That is those with central obesity, uh, particularly around the waist, plus any two of the following. So dyslipidemia with triglycerides above 150 milligrams percent or low HDL cholesterol or under treatment elevated blood pressure um, or uh, being under treatment for hypertension uh, and then fasting blood glucose greater than 100 milligrams percent. Um, so we reported out um, uh, on uh, 473 veterans, mean age of 56, about half of them had paraplegia, half with tetraplegia. Three quarters of them had BMI greater than 22 kilograms uh, per meter squared, which I know you don't think is, uh, is obese, but it is in our spinal cord injury population. I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Um, more than two thirds had HDL cholesterol less than 40 milligrams percent. About 50% had fasting blood sugars greater than 100 milligrams percent or were under treatment for diabetes. And 55% had hypertension. So 57 and a half percent of this veteran population just was just a cross-sectional picture um, actually had uh, metabolic syndrome as defined by the International Diabetes Federation. Um, we followed that up a few years later, looking at individuals uh, with C5 to L2 motor complete, that is Asian impairment scale A and B. Um, in 72 individuals, um, most of whom were male, but 13 females, 72% had paraplegia. Their mean age was 44 and their time since injury was 14 years. Um, if you just looked at a, um, uh, a BMI of greater than 22 kilograms per meter squared, which is appropriate uh, cutoff or a threshold for persons with spinal cord injury to be obese, 82% of this population uh, uh, would have been categorized as obese. However, when we did um, body composition analysis by four compartment mo modeling, we found that 97% of this, uh, this group um, actually were obese, um, meaning that men had, uh, or 97% or of men uh, had over 22% body fat um, and uh, women greater than 35% body fat. 83% um, uh, had dyslipidemia, um, primarily because of HDL cholesterol, uh, and we looked at differences between men and women uh, hovering right around 80%. 32% of our population had fasting blood sugars greater than 100 milligrams percent or were under treatment for diabetes. 43% had high blood pressure with systolic blood pressures greater than 130 or diastolic pressure, uh, 
blood pressure is greater than 85. And these, uh, we were absolutely sure were not autonomic dysreflexia. Um, so ultimately, um, almost 60%, uh, again, uh, this population had metabolic syndrome by the definition provided by the International Diabetes Federation. So how do you treat that? Primarily through diet and exercise. Uh, we'll talk about some of these other things um, in a few minutes. Uh, Mark Nash and, uh, and several others of us uh, put together the cardiometabolic risk uh, and management strategies for the uh, PBA consortium guidelines uh, that were published in 2019, uh, demonstrating a significant risk because of obesity uh, diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, and, and provided some recommendations with regard to nutrition, uh, physical activity, and pharmacotherapy. Um, basically, uh, we are recommending screening uh, for persons uh, who we feel are at risk for uh, diabetes at least every three years. Um, and then if they uh, have been demonstrated to have impaired glucose tolerance to follow up annually, um, those with obesity or uh, we feel are at risk for obesity really should have annual testing. Uh, and then similarly, those with uh, dyslipidemia, we should be annually testing and uh, treating uh, as we find elevated risks. Um, and again, keeping track of blood pressure, uh, monitoring every visit, but at least annually, um, and then managing uh, pharmacologically, both the lipids and the high blood pressure. Um, we need to do what we can to provide uh, nutritional um, guidelines and uh, information about physical activity so that we are appropriately managing metabolic syndrome. But the bottom line is pharmacological treatment alone is probably not uh, going to make significant difference um, and we're going to have to uh, somehow trim some of the fat. Uh, that's the bottom line um, in order to improve their metabolic uh, profiles. So our folks with spinal cord injury um, are also at risk for accelerated aging of the skin because it's neurogenic. It doesn't have the uh, neurotrophic influences um, and, and uh, folks don't have sensations that you or I would typically use to prevent pressure injuries in particular. Um, in general, all of us are gonna have thinning of the epidermis and dermis as we age uh, with some subcutaneous tissue loss and diminished elasticity. Um, that puts us at increased risk for shears, abrasions, uh, lacerations, and bruising. Um, but our folks with spinal cord injury are particularly at risk because they aren't getting those signals telling them that their skin is becoming ischemic. And more importantly, that the fascia and muscle underlying the skin is becoming ischemic. Um, so we need to do as much as we can to prophylax against pressure injuries, um, trying to uh, optimize their nutrition, uh, pressure relief, and then when necessary, using surgical options to to heal a wound and then making sure that we have addressed the etiology. What is the cause? What, what happened that this person developed a wound and what are we gonna do in the future to prevent it? With regard to respiratory, uh, uh, many of our folks with spinal cord injury are gonna be um, at high risk for neurogenic restrictive as well as obstructive lung disease. Uh, consortium guidelines have, have been put out by the Paralyzed Veterans of America. These are undergoing review um, actually at this point, but we recognize for a number of different reasons, our folks are gonna be at high risk. Um, part of this is a neurogenic restrictive um, lung disease that uh, is associated with muscular paralysis um, and the inability to um, fully activate the diaphragm, the intercostals, uh, and to cough and clear secretions um, as would be needed, uh, but is blocked because of abdominal muscle paralysis. Recognize that under normal conditions, our abdominal muscles hold our abdominal contents in and up against the diaphragm, doming it. 
so that when we activate it, um, we actually have a fairly good tidal volume here that we can generate. For uh, individuals who have paralyzed abdominal muscles, the resting length of the diaphragm is significantly less. And so when they contract it fully, um, there's, they're only able to uh, generate a relatively small tidal volume. Um, we can compensate for this with an abdominal binder, pulling the abdominal contents back uh, in and up against the diaphragm to reestablish its resting length. Um, and subsequently the, uh, the appropriate tidal volume, the inspiratory volume. Um, this is uh, a very practical thing that we need to do for our folks with spinal cord injury. Um, however, I've found fewer and fewer of, uh, of our folks with spinal cord injury will continue to use their abdominal binders as they age. And it does put them at higher risk for um, respiratory uh, dysfunction. Um, so the things that I just talked about are associated with low vital capacity, total lung capacity, which is diminished. Generally speaking, uh, without an abdominal binder, these folks are going to have a shallow uh, and very rapid breathing. Their pulmonary compliance is diminished. Um, and uh, other examples of uh, restrictive lung disease include scoliosis, obesity, uh, which our folks have as well obstructive apnea, sleep apnea, which our folks have as well, um, and then some of these other things. In addition to the uh, restrictive lung disease, however, our folks have developed a neurogenic obstructive lung disease because of the sympathetic blocking, um, or blunting, I should say, uh, due to the level of the spinal cord injury. And this puts the um, person basically in a state of parasympathetic dominance most of the time where they're gonna have bronchiolar constriction and mucus secretions even at rest. Um, so uh, this is going to put them at significant risk for developing mucus plugging. Remember mucus generally is a good thing. Um, we produce it to help get rid of it. It uh, literally sticks to uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, dust particles, et cetera, that otherwise would get trapped in the lungs and lead to um, a disease process. Um, so generally speaking, mucus is good. However, if you can't clear the mucus because you can't generate a significant cough, um, then it will actually clog up your airways um, and you're going to end up having significant problems with mucus plugging, such as this individual um, who has a C C6 uh, spinal cord injury. So this is uh, this whiteout is a result of a mucus plug um, usually it would occur in the right uh, main stem bronchus, uh, you would think, but um, we've got problems uh, on both sides and we need to intervene pretty um, aggressively with bronchodilators, mucolytic agents, and then uh, insufflation, exufflation. Um, trying to prevent bronchoscopy, uh, at bronchoscopy as uh, much as possible because it is a very anxiety producing um, scenario and we really shouldn't uh, allow our folks to get to that point. So part of what we use is secretion management, um, doing uh, postural percussion and drainage uh, and quad coughing, um, as well as mechanical and exufflation. I recommend, uh, particularly when folks are um, in the hospital with respiratory uh, dysfunction, um, using a combination of nebulizer treatments uh, every 30 minutes, so dual nebs, um, moisten the secretions uh, and help to open the airways, um, followed immediately by postural percussion and drainage um, or vibration to shake those um, uh, uh, secretions loose um, and then using mechanical inexufflation as necessary to clear the mucus from the airways. All of this needs to be done within 30 minutes though of the nebulizer treatment um, or again, the mucus will just uh, dry up and cause a mucus plug. So um, these are things we need to keep in mind. Also keep in mind that our folks are at higher risk for sleep apnea, partly because of the obesity, but also because of the neurogenic uh, restrictive and obstructive uh, lung diseases. Um, and so we know that our folks uh, do have significantly greater rates of sleep apnea, uh, even those with paraplegia, 
than in the uh, able-bodied population. This is gonna put them at higher risk for hypoxia as well. So if a person wakes up with a headache, my first thought is um, maybe their bladder's distended and they're having autonomic dysreflexia. So that could kill them. I'm gonna manage that quickly. Um, but if I find that it's not, their headache is not related to the autonomic dysreflexia, then I start thinking about the likelihood of sleep uh, apnea, hypoxia while they're uh, sleeping and uh, put them on a sleeping study to see if they might uh, be helped uh, using CPAP or BiPAP, uh, positive airway pressure. Um, this device, um, I would like to throw away, but they, they typically will test folks with this in the sleep laboratories. The problem with this device is in order to maintain a positive airway pressure, you have to pull it pretty tightly across the ridge of the nose. And that often causes a pressure injury and or bruising across the bridge of the nose and they will use it once and never again. Um, on the other hand, we can provide folks a mouthpiece and nasal trumpets uh, that will work very well and don't cause significant uh, discomfort. The um, compliance rate with this is more than 90%. The compliance rate with this is about 10%. So you can see how um, just providing the appropriate equipment may make a difference for folks. <coughs> I'm running a little bit uh, short of time on uh, everything that I wanna cover, but um, just recognize that our folks, um, if they're going to be discharged on a ventilator, they need to be uh, taught how to do glossopharyngeal breathing. Um, and uh, there's a great uh, movie out. Uh, it is um, based there. I think the original one had Jimmy Stewart, um, Rear Window. Uh, anyway, there was a remake with Christopher Reeve um, where somebody, somebody actually came in and turned off his ventilator and he didn't die. No, 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 he didn't die. He, um, he kept kept himself alive using glossopharyngeal breathing, frog breathing, uh, for the next, what seems like several hours, but it was actually just uh, uh, about 30 to 60 seconds. Um, you see him glossopharyngeal breathing, and then luckily his attendant was nearby, recognized uh, that there was something wrong and turned the ventilator back on, and, and he survived. Um, it's important that we recommend pneumococcal vaccine for our folks with spinal cord injury um, because they are at higher risk uh, with neurogenic restrictive and obstructive lung disease, as well as annual flu vaccine and now, yes, the COVID vaccine. <coughs> we don't know um, moving forward how frequently we're going to have to administer that, but um, obviously we're already talking about booster injections for those of us who got our uh, our first uh, vaccines uh, completed um, last winter. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, folks with spinal cord injury are uh, poikilothermic or at least partially poikilothermic, meaning that they will their body will take on the temperature of the ambient temperature around them. Um, and part of this again is because of their blunted sympathetic nervous system. They're, inability to sweat above the level of the spinal cord injury. And, uh, and yet um, they will uh, shiver uh, to some extent, but not uh, to the extent necessary to help maintain their, their thermal regulation. So recognize that um, they are at risk for hypothermia as well as hyperthermia. Um, and this also uh, contributes to the aging process. Um, most of our folks with spinal cord injury are going to have blunted anabolic hormones um, and uh, a, a slight increase in catabolic hormones. Uh, and, and this is tied together with their levels of obesity as well. So recognize that uh, we may, particularly for the men, need to provide testosterone replacement, particularly if we're going to be uh, exercising them to a significant extent and hoping to increase muscle mass. Um, we have to uh, keep in mind that this may decrease their high density lipoprotein cholesterol and increase their LDL cholesterol, but you have to take the, um, uh, the overall uh, pluses and minus of this and uh, determine whether individuals are gonna benefit from testosterone or hormonal replacement. 
We know that there are a number of uh, changes associated with um, spinal cord injury on bone because of the combination mechanical and loading, um, the blunted hormonal responses, the neuronal changes, and then the obesity-related cytokines, which also stimulate osteoclastic activity of the bone. All of this leads to um, osteoporosis, particularly in the lower extremities. Uh, for persons with paraplegia who are using their upper extremities for um, uh, mobility and wheelchair propulsion, um, they actually will offset uh, to some extent uh, so that we may actually see higher uh, levels of bone mineral density in the upper extremities for those individuals. Um, but generally speaking, we need to worry about uh, the overall influences of uh, spinal cord injury on bone. Um, again, seeing the upper extremities, at least for those with paraplegia, may be higher than uh, would be expected. Um, bone mineral density in the region of the spinal cord injury can be increased because of fusion. Uh, but when we look at uh, lower extremities, we see oftentimes they are much lower uh, than what we consider to be healthy. More than two standard deviations below normal is called osteoporosis. And most of our folks with motor complete, I would say almost all of our folks with motor complete um, spinal cord injury um, are going to have osteoporosis in the lower extremities. So uh, that being said, we know that that's right around the fracture threshold. Um, management strategies can include calcium and vitamin D, uh, potentially bisphosphonates and mechanical loading. Uh, the uh, Paralyzed Veterans of America Consortium guidelines have just been written and reviewed. They will be released, uh, I think, later this year. Um, and so we'll have a little bit more definitive management strategies as, as we move forward with that. Our folks um, with spinal cord injury are using their upper extremities to a much greater extent than, uh, than those extremities were made uh, for. And so, uh, very likely that they will develop musculoskeletal dysfunction uh, related to overuse. Um, this can be in the form of rotator cuff uh, impingement, epicondylitis, de Quervain's tenosynovitis, um, metacarpal phalangeal dysfunction, and oftentimes ulnar and median neuropathies associated with using uh, wheelchairs. So we recognize that and recognize that as folks age, um, we're going to have to make accommodations for their mobility devices. Neurogenic bladder um, is something uh, that is somewhat unique to spinal cord injury. Upper motor neuron injuries um, are likely to generate high pressures that can cause vesicle ureteral reflux and um, acute renal failure. Um, our folks, uh, generally speaking, are going to be uh, optimizing their bladder management uh, with intermittent catheterization. Um, and, uh, and this abnormal way of voiding, uh, unfortunately, is going to put them at higher risk for urinary tract infections and uh, bladder stones. If they're using intermittent catheterization as opposed to indwelling catheters, um, they're going to have uh, um, only a slight increase of risk uh, for bladder cancers, calculi, and uh, urinary tract infections related to, or, or compared to those who are using indwelling catheters. Um, we know that um, on an ongoing basis, we need to be assessing the integrity of the upper uh, urinary tracts as well as the, the lower uh, urinary tracts. So on an annual basis, we will be doing laboratory studies um, and about every other year looking at nuclear renal scans to assess renal function, uh, a renal ultrasound to assess the upper urinary tracts. Um, and depending upon what we're finding, we may need to do abdominal CTs looking at um, or looking for bladder calculi um, or uh, ureteral and renal calculi. Um, we should be doing cystoscopies approximately every five years for those who have indwelling catheters because they are at higher risk for developing um, uh, bladder cancers, um, and then doing uh, urodynamics either annually or every other year, uh, and that would include avoiding cystic looking at the integrity of the lower urinary tracts. Um, 
pharmacological intervention as necessary to maintain low bladder pressures and continence. Um, so uh, as necessary, again, um, uh, spasticity can contribute to uh, muscle contractures and spasticity of the bladder is uh, not unlike uh, other skeletal muscle in that under a constant state of uh, contractile tone, um, it will shrink and become smaller. And so it may be necessary uh, in order to have an appropriate bladder volume to augment uh, the bladder by sewing on a, a portion of, of um, ileum, uh, for example, just to expand, expand the reservoir uh, for holding that. Um, some folks would uh, benefit from using Mitrofenov uh, appendicovesicostomies. So this is essentially um, uh, allowing a conduit uh, using uh, a portion of the appendix uh, actually sewn into the bladder itself. Uh, that is catheterizable. So the person can essentially go through uh, where the umbilicus was um, and uh, cat themselves this way. It's uh, a lot easier than doing urethral um, bladder management. There uh, are recommendations, relatively new recommendations for bladder management uh, that would include us looking at voiding diaries, imaging studies, uh, and laboratory exams, as well as looking at self-reported quality of life scales. And so these are things that we will need to do as we continue on. Um, the uh, sexuality reproductive health um, is also going to be affected after spinal cord injury. Most men with spinal cord injury will have some degree of uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, women, uh, surprisingly or not, uh, most uh, who are Premenopausal will regain uh, their usual menstrual cycle within three to six months after a spinal cord injury, um, but they have additional uh, concerns, health concerns, um, in that uh, they do need to have yearly pap smears, mammograms, and, and sometimes it's difficult to get access uh, for persons who are in a wheelchair for those uh, particular um, tests. They are also at high risk uh, for um, developing autonomic dysreflexia and having problems with pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind as well. Um, both men and women uh, list high up uh, on their priority list sexual function, um, as well as bowel and bladder management uh, in terms of if there's one thing that they could fix or reverse, uh, they would prefer that it be sex and bowel and bladder uh, control. So all of these are things that we need to consider as our folks are aging. Um, neurogenic bowel, not unlike neurogenic uh, bladder, uh, has a high likelihood of having um, upper motor neuron involvement and incontinence. Um, for those with cotoquina injuries and lower motor neuron involvement, they're gonna have to worry about passive evacuation. Um, both of these scenarios, uh, well, this one in particular, uh, we worry about with upper motor neuron injuries. So the pubal rectalis is a muscle that helps to maintain continence in, in addition to the external anal sphincter. So it pulls uh, this tight so that you're less likely to have incontinence, um, but it's hard uh, to let it relax under conditions of hyperreflexia associated with spinal cord injury. And so we end up having this, um, not unlike detrusor sphincter dysinergia, here we have rec recto sphincter dysinergia uh, that contributes to incontinence as well. So uh, managing this for persons with uh, spinal cord injury is very important, um, certainly to uh, help promote uh, community reintegration and uh, reduce the likelihood of social paralysis uh, because of bowel incontinence. Um, we need to find appropriate management strategies um, and that typically would be um, using a bowel care program with suppositories, digital stimulation on an every other day basis, but may require uh, other types of management strategies, including trans anal irrigation uh, with a retrograde uh, enema 
um, surgical procedures, including colostomies and or the Malone uh, anti-grade uh, continence enema procedure, which basically moves forward. Uh, uh, so you basically put forward the, uh, uh, push forward the stool that is in the colon uh, from the appendix through uh, this catheterizable stoma. As with the bladder, uh, there is a lot of uh, research going on, a lot of um, need for research to go on uh, for our folks with spinal cord injury to optimize uh, their care as we go through there. And then we worry about neurological changes post spinal cord injury. So particularly we worry about the development of a syrinx, uh, which could uh, cause uh, an ascending loss of sensory and motor function over time and is associated with aging after a spinal cord injury. So generally speaking, when we look at the uh, consortium uh, clinical practice guidelines for spinal cord injury, we are provided information about different levels of spinal cord injury and their expected outcomes. But those expected outcomes really only relates to the first a few years of spinal cord injury. And with aging, um, the uh, expected outcomes are going to change. Um, so we need to recognize that as well as the psychosocial implications of aging uh, with a spinal cord injury. With higher rates of depression, uh, particularly for uh, um, traumatic spinal cord injury, post-traumatic stress uh, types of things, um, and risk for suicides. Uh, most of our folks will have some problems with adjustment uh, disorder, uh, adjustment to their disability. And uh, socially, we need to advocate uh, for environmental uh, community friendly um, access uh, to lots of different activities um, and resources. So in summary, um, aging with a spinal cord injury appears to be uh, accelerated. Almost every organ system is affected and aging is going to affect functional tasks um, and community mobility as well as the psychosocial burden. So there will be some individual variability depending upon the individual's genetics, general health and body habitus and their lifestyle. Um, but uh, Folks with spinal cord injury are going to age much more quickly uh, than if they didn't have a spinal cord injury. So I come to the end. Um, we've got a few folks on. Uh, hopefully I've answered most of your questions, but I wanted to uh, allow a couple of minutes. If you do have questions, this would be a great time to do that. I'll stop sharing my screen. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? Wow, I must have done a greater job than I thought. Never gets old, does it? <clears throat> well, that was. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, dialing in. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll continue on the lecture series uh, next week. Everybody take care and um, continue to enjoy your summer. <laughs>